Welcome to part three. My goal in the first part of part three is to talk about the absolute value. Here we have the Jacobian for the transformation of two variables and we use the absolute value and we can also use the absolute value around this and that's where I would like to start. Now let's start with the U transformation that we addressed earlier. Now I'm going to add some criteria to this. I'm going to put a little plus after the X and for me that's going to indicate that we have fixed bounds and the bounds are going from small to large so the fact that the bounds are going small to large will say that it's positively bounded or positively oriented in its bounds. Now here's the twist. If I put a plus next to the U saying that now the U will be positively oriented in its bounds then I could put an absolute value around the linking operator. There is one additional criteria however that U when we do a U substitution we say that U is some function of X but this transformation where U is a function of X it must be a one to one transformation. And that becomes an important criteria when we set up the Jacobian in the double integral. It also has to be a one to one transformation and will make the equivalent to why we're putting an absolute value there also. Let's do an example to illustrate this. Suppose we have the definite integral from zero to three of the function e to the negative 3x dx. We make the u substitution that u is going to be negative 3x. Now I would like to point out here that this is a one-to-one -one function. I would also like to point out that this one-to-one -one function that we defined is a decreasing function. And so that will play tricks on the bounds, which I will show you here. Notice that when x is equal to 0, u is going to be 0. But when x equals 3, then u is going to equal negative 9. So in our typical setup, we're going to have the integral from 0 to negative 9, e to the u, then we have a negative 1 third, du. That's the typical setup. However, if I force this now to have a positive bounded orientation, so I go from small to large, then I have e to the u, then I'll have negative one-third, but I'm going to put that into absolute value to maintain the equality. We don't typically need to do the step we're permitted to, but we don't need to make positively oriented bounds. If we just follow the normal procedures, well, the bounds may flip, but we're not concerned about that because when we do the fundamental theorem of calculus, it all works out. See, these bounds just translate real nicely and we don't even think about it. However, this is not the case with double integrals. The bounds don't translate like they do here, so we force the absolute value and then we force a positively oriented bound structure, which is what I would like to illustrate using some of the earlier examples. In example three, where we did a polar transformation, we set this up and then we said e to the negative r squared, we put in the absolute value of the Jacobian and we went dr d theta and we didn't directly relate bounds to bounds what we did we came over to this polar region and we oriented it positively we said well theta rotates counterclockwise as theta increases we move counterclockwise and then we went from lower r to upper r so we fixed the bounds to be a positively oriented bound structure. So theta went from 0 to pi over 2, and r went from 1 to 2. 
we can also see here that because r is between 1 and 2, we don't actually need the absolute value, and that's generally the case. And then in example 5, if you recall, we let x equals 1 half the quantity v minus u and y equals 1 half quantity u plus v. We found the Jacobian to be negative 1 half, and then we ended up using the absolute value of that. So when we translated this, we ended up with e to the u divided by v power. Then we took the absolute value of the Jacobian and du dv. Now when we did the bounds of the area, we didn't directly relate them. We just looked at the new region and we provided a positively oriented structure where we fix one variable from small to large and then we take the other one from small to large as well. In this case, what did we do? We took it from v equals 1 to v equals 2. See, that's a positively oriented area structure. And then we went from the lower function of u equals negative v to u equals positive v. So we provided a positively oriented structure. And because we are forcing a positively oriented structure, we need the absolute value of the Jacobian. It is also worth pointing out here that we do have a one-to-one -one transformation. See, if you pick a point x comma y, and that point x comma y, let's just make up one. Let's say 1 comma 2. Then uv that corresponds to that point would be, well, let's see, 2 minus 1 is 1 for u, and 2 plus 1 is 3 for v. Okay, that's fine. So for every point that I plug in here, I only get one point as an output, and that's a different point. 1, 2 in the xy plane translates to 1, 3 in the uv plane. Now, you may wonder, all right, can I pick another point uv that has the output of 1, 3, but had a different input xy? Well, perhaps you see that u is y minus x, so if y is just one unit more than x, let's say like this, well then certainly though u is going to still be 1, but the v then has to be 3 plus 4, which would have to be not 3, but 7. And so 1, 7 is a totally different point than 1, 3. And I'm not proving that this is 1 to 1. I'm giving you some anecdotal evidence that for every point in u, v, it maps to only one point in x, y, and vice versa. Hence, this is a 1 to 1 transformation correspondence. Now, let's just talk a minute about this expression and why this works, where this comes from. Now, you would definitely be served well by knowing a whole bunch of linear algebra and or possibly surface integrals. Now, surface integrals is something that we will do in this course. And I have a way of explaining this, but it takes some time to understand the parametrization of a surface and the idea behind a normal vector and how to talk about parallelogram patches. Now, ultimately, your author will talk about two vectors, one called RU. Now, I'll let you read about where these vectors come from, from the tangent plane, but par x, par u, par y, par u, and the other vector is r sub v, or the partial with respect to v, and that gives us par x, par v, par y, par v. Now, if I do r u cross r v, well, that gives me a normal vector to something, but if you take the magnitude of r u cross r v, well, then you get a parallelogram, and the author's using the idea of an infinitely small parallelogram patch to talk about where this quantity comes from. See, if you actually do this cross product, i, j, k, par x, par u, par y, par u, 
and then we insert a zero. Par x, par v, par y, par v, insert a zero. If we do that, then we're going to get zero, comma, zero, comma, and then we're going to get this expression that we found up above. Par x, par u, par y, par v, minus par x, par v, times par y, par u. And then the magnitude of that is the absolute value of par x, par u, par y, par v, minus par x, par v, par y, par u.